Hi everybody, welcome back to my quantum field theory of students perspective. Today I'm going to um, continue with my blog and do, um, so I'm going to continue with the uh, QFT review blog. And today I'm going to quickly do uh, Peskin and Schroeder, chapter 2, on the uh, Klein-Gordon field. Just basically a classical field. I'm going to go quite quickly, um, but I want to start off by talking about conventions. Because this is a little bit of a problem. Every QFT book I have uses a different convention. So let's go through them just to show you what I mean. Peskin and Schroeder, they define the field. Let's just talk about it the Schrodinger field is uh, the integral of d3p 2 pi cubed 1 over the square root of 2 omega p um, a p e and I won't always put the arrows on top of the variables you'll have to figure out whether they're supposed to be there or not e dagger p e to the minus i P dot X. So there's all these factors. There's the 2 pi cubed. There's also the square root of 2 omega P. When you look in other books, you won't see that there. You might see a 2 omega P. Everybody defines their creation operators differently and so on, and, and you'll see in a second. First of all, um, the metric that Peskin and Schroeder use is the standard, I think it's the West Coast metric that I like. So um, for Peskin and Schroeder, the commutation relations are kind of funny looking. They have a 2 pi cubed and a del 3 p minus p prime. So if you had like a 2 pi to the 3 halves, you wouldn't have this 2 pi cube there. Similarly, they'll, they'll define their states, P, as being the square root to uh, EP. EP is equal to omega P, is equal to the square root, it's always plus, square root of P squared plus M squared. Okay, so P, A dagger, P, should be a subscript here, acting on the vacuum. So again, there's this funny factor here. If you had 2 omega P over here instead of a uh, square root, then you wouldn't need that factor. Likewise, um, from this you usually get P, Q is equal to 2 EP, 2 pi cubed, del 3 P minus Q. So that's uh, Peskin and Schroeder. Now if you happen to go to uh, Srednecki's book, it's quite different. First of all, he uses the East Coast metric. So you always have to keep that in mind. He defines this invariant relativistic measure and then the field is um, I'm also writing it the way they write it. Some of them use subscripts, some of them use parentheses, so on. So let's compare this. So he's basically, he has the 2 pi cubed. That's the same. But here's a square root, and here is a uh, 
a 2 ohm a, uh, without a square root. So keep that in mind. And then he defines um, the commutation relations. He defines these operators so that So it seems like he's using the exact same commutation relations. Um, no, I'm sorry. So you see, he's got the same 2 pi cubed and the delta's the same, but now he has a factor 2 omega, whereas Pesk and Schroeder don't have that because he's got a, an extra 2 omega in the denominator when you have two, um, two creation operators. Okay, and he defines his states. Actually, he defines relativistic states. He's always using, so Necky is always using relativistic. And um, so he's going to just decay without a vector. And it's just defined as A dagger K inside operating on the vacuum. Okay. Now, to make matters, you know, just to show you how every book does it differently, Coleman does it two different ways. And uh, Coleman also uses the 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 metric. He has Vx is equal to the integral d3p, 2 pi to the 3 halves, 2 omega p, to the three halves. I'm sorry, that's wrong. To the one half. Then he has APE to the I, P dot X plus A dagger P E to the minus I, P dot X. Okay, so you see his differ a little bit even more because he's got square roots in this measure, whereas Sunecki has the full relativistic measure, and Peskin and Schroeder has a square root, but not a square root in the 2 pi. So you can see he's going to have a different variation. His variation is AP, A dagger P prime equal del 3 P minus P prime. No factors. And... Um, and P Q equals del 3 P minus Q. So he's using a non-relativistic convention, but he also defines these relativistic creation and annihilation operators. He defines these alphas, 2 pi to the 3 halves, square root of 2 omega P, AP. And in terms of the alphas, the phi becomes the integral of d3p, 2 pi cubed, 2 omega p. So he ends up with the convention that Srinecki does, but he calls these alpha p's. But he doesn't use it very much. Occasionally he uses it in the book, but most of the time he doesn't. And uh, he uses, like Sugnecki, and uh, these are sort of his relativistic things. So, as you can see, he's got. His alphas are just like the, um, I'm sorry, um, so his alphas end up being just like Sinecki's A's, and, um, and he has the measure like Sinecki. So Coleman 
uses two conventions, one of which he uses the relativistic less than others, and is similar to the Sernecki convention, and Peskin and Schroeder is just different. So you have to be careful with these, whether you have a 2 omega p in the denominator, a square root of 2 omega p. If you have a square root somewhere else, it's going to show up to sort of uh, fix it. And then the same thing with the two pi's and everything. So the lesson is simple. Don't just copy equations from one book to another or expect to get the exact same um, equation. You have to look at the conventions that the book is using and, and make some conversions. It's a real pain in the neck sometimes, but that's just what you have to do. And it will get even worse when you start using the Dirac equation where they'll use different, you know, Cairo versus... Um, energy representations and so on, it becomes even harder to, um, to do. Okay, so I just want to bring that up. That's just a problem in physics and quantum field theory. So since I covered scalar fields pretty extensively on my website on Piazza on the QFT course with videos and everything in, in lessons two and three, I'm not going to go into much detail on Peskin, what Peskin and Schroeder does, which is just the basic stuff. I do want to talk about, highlight just two points. Causality. Now, causality in quantum field theory means that if you have two fields, one at point X, and this is a space-time point, and one at point Y, if these are, if if x minus y squared is less than zero, so with the Peskin and Schroeder metric, that means it's space-like. That means like here's x and here's the light cone and y is going to be somewhere like there. So this is space-like. Then the basic idea in quantum mechanics is, is that if the commutator is equal to zero, then these things can be measured independently. It's like if um, whenever we have two operators that, that can commute, we can measure them at the same time without worrying about one interfering with another. So we say if, if two fields are outside each other's light cone, are space-like, then we should have the commutator equal to zero. So this is the uh, condition. And it only applies when x and y are space-like. Now, Peskin and Schroeder define the D function sort of like the propagator. The idea here is phi of y creates a particle at y, and then the other phi, and then we figure out the overlap with the particle at x. So we imagine if there's a particle at y what are the chances that it will also be observed at x? So then we take the states, a particle at y is phi of y, and a particle at x is phi of x, and we, um, I'm sorry, a particle at y is phi of y opting on the vacuum, this, and we take the overlap. That's what this is. So you could think of this as a propagator. Now, um, it's easy to show if you substitute in the fields. Remember, the A will kill the vacuum on the right, and the A dagger will kill the vacuum on the left, so it's easy to show that this is equal to D3P, 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 EP, E to the minus I, P, X minus Y. And remember, this whole thing, as Schenecke defines and as everybody shows is relativistically invariant measure. So if the rest of this expression, which is obvious in this case, is Lorentz covariant, then the whole integral is Lorentz covariant. So this whole function is Lorentz covariant. Now Now we can compute the commutator in terms of these functions. And again, 
It's very easy to show. We're just substituting in the definition. I'm leaving out the arrows on the P's and Q's here. Then we have the commutator. Just uh, evaluate these with the delta functions and the, using the commutation relators on the uh, creation and annihilation operators, you get the integral of d3p over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 ep, e to the minus ip dot x minus y minus e to the ip x minus y. Okay, and this is equal to, you know, as we define the d function above, this is exactly that. So this is equal to d of x minus y. And here we have to get a minus sign in the um, exponent in order to get it in the d form over here. So um, we write this as d of y minus x. Now, looking at this, it's not obvious that this is equal to zero. We want to show it's equal to zero, but there's a real nice argument, Lorenz invariance, that Peskin and Schroeder make, and it's very easy to see. Again, imagine here's the light cone. We know that when two points are space-like separated in one frame of reference, one can appear later than the other one. So this is going to be like uh, y minus x in one frame. But we can do a, Lor a, a Lorentz transformation, you know, and just rotate it to there. Notice outside the light cone, and I don't have the exact diagram that Peskin and Schroeder have. I encourage you to um, look at it. Let me give you a reference. It's on um, figure 2.4 page 29, but it's really important to see that you can do that. You can't do this if these points were time-like separated. Let's say, let's say we had a point here. We wouldn't be able to go to its negative over here because that's, um, you know, we, we that's a discrete transformation of a reversal of time. It's not the same as a rotation in space or a Lorentz transformation. This we can always do when they're space-like separated. When things are um, time-like separated, we can't do that. So this gives. So this is. So this shows that the commutator of phi x, phi y equals zero when x minus y squared is less than zero, or space-like. That gives us our causality condition. Okay. Now, the next thing um, that you should take away from this chapter is toward the end he defines various propagators. Kind of defined one above with the d. He defines the retarded propagator, uses the symbol R on it, and it's defined as um, theta of x0 minus y0. In other words, x0, this is the, um, oh, I can't remember the name. Um, it's, not the theta, it's not the delta function, it's the integral of the delta function. And, um, you know, it's 1 
theta of x is equal to 1 when x is greater than 0, and it's equal to 0 when x is less than 0. Don't worry about 0. So, um, so it's this times 0, the commutator of phi x, comma phi y. And uh, so it's a definition, and turns out this is evaluated to the integral d4p over 2 pi to the fourth i over p squared minus m squared e to the i psi p dot x minus y. And this factor over here, you'll notice, is sort of the momentum space propagator. This is the momentum space retarded propagator, and it's it's evaluated by in momentum space, or you know, in, when we evaluate the contour from minus of the energy contour p zero, we go like this. We go along here. We go above the pole. This is minus e p. Go along here. Then we go above the pole again, plus EP. And then we go here. And it's easy to show that basically when you evaluate it using a contour integral, you're going to want um, P to be negative imaginary. That will be exponentially damp. So you want to close it along the bottom path. You enclose the poles. Um, so you'll get a propagator, an amount. If you enclose on the top, you won't enclose the poles and you'll get zero. So basically when, when um, x0 is greater than y0, you, um, you close below. And when x0 is less than y0, you, you close the contour above. Okay. Then he introduces the more important, for our purposes, Feynman propagator. And here it's done. I remember when my professor, Zach Ryerson, was teaching quantum field theory at Caltech, he said, it wasn't obvious to do this. It took the genius of Feynman to figure this out. You know, it's easy when you see it. And this is the proper path to get the Feynman propagator. And um, we define it by df x minus y. It's just a regular propagator when x0 is greater than y0. And it's the negative of that when x0 is less than y0. So... Um, And this is, uh, this is also defined as the time-ordered, and we'll get more into that later in a few chapters. It's very important, these time-ordered products, expectation values in the vacuum. And this will be equal to, and this is all in the book, I'm just you know repeating it. The calculations are all routine. I over P squared minus M squared plus I epsilon. The I epsilon enforces the poles and um, e to the minus i p dot x minus y. So this is the Feynman propagator and this is momentum space propagator. We'll use that a lot in Feynman diagrams. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is a uh, classical source. So if we had a Lagrangian the standard Lagrangian, but we added a term. And this is this is just a classical C number. Source. But because this is linear, this is exactly solvable. And Coleman, in his quantum field theory chapters, when he starts doing uh, perturbation theory, 
he actually solves this model. I think this is a uh, model two. By the way, this is like um, limited in time. So a diagram of the source would be something like this is the t-axis. At infinity, it would be zero, and then it would like maybe go up, do this, do that, and then it would go to zero again. So at past infinity, it's zero, and at future infinity, it's zero. And Coleman solves this problem using perturbation theory, and he mentions that there are many ways to solve it. And Peskin and Schroeder solves it just directly by solving the differential equation. The differential equation from the Lagrangian is um, very is linear, and that's why it's um, easy to solve. Now, um, without the source, just the homogeneous equation, we know the solution is just the free field. I'll write it again for you. Um, this is the uh, Heisenberg field, so these are like time. They have time in there. And um, with the classical source, the inhomogeneous equation has a solution. We're only interested in the solution as um, t goes to t goes to infinity. You know, x is equal to t comma x. So, to show this, Peskin and Schroeder just write this down. It's it's obvious what to do, but in case you don't see it, just show that it satisfies the equation of motion. So apply the partial squared plus m squared times phi of x. Partial squared plus m squared on phi zero x by definition is zero because that is uh, the free equation of motion. And then I have plus i, the integral of d4y. I'll write, I'll put a subscript here to note what I'm acting on, the variable dr. Why? Now, um, if you look at equation 256, page 30, he defines, he shows what this is. It's a, it's a calculation. I'm not going to do it again, but the integral of d4y, it ends up being minus i del 4x minus y j of y. And then you evaluate this, which is trivial. And it's j of x, and that's what we want. So this solution here solves the equation of motion, and it solves the boundary conditions because when um, the retarded is zero, when, um, when x is minus infinity, it's going to be less than um, y, and so um, this will vanish. So it solves the boundary conditions as well. Now... Um, the solution is very easy to get on this. You just use a Fourier transform. And again, in, in these Fourier transforms, P is on the mass shell. And um, the solution will end up being, if you do a couple of substitutions, it will be very easy to see that it's equal to d3p, 2 pi cubed, 1 over the square root of 2ep, ap plus i over the square root of 2ep, j tilde p times, um, I'm sorry, Okay, this is phi. 
times e to the minus i p dot x plus the uh, Hermitian conjugate of that. And uh, this easily leads to a Hamiltonian that's It's interesting that you get an exact solution, but it uh, shouldn't surprise us for a linear um, equation of motion. This is the Hamiltonian, and then if you want to find out how much energy you made, and you can also find out how many particles you made, it's very simple. Here, remember the A will kill the vacuum, and the A dagger will kill the vacuum on the other side, so we'll end up getting a very nice expression. One half the absolute value of J of P squared. Okay. So that's all I wanted to cover in um, Peskin and Schroeder, Chapter 2. It is important that um, you, um, you fully understand this chapter and the manipulations and everything. And uh, this is standard, and all the textbooks cover this material. And, um, but there's um, this little thing on the classical source that Peskin and Schroeder isn't shown everywhere else. And I like their causality argument on the uh, Lorentz transformation for space-like um, vectors. So I'll talk to you next time when I'll um, start on Chapter 3 in the Dirac equation in um, Peskin Schroeder. Thank you for watching.